So we're, I'm glad to introduce, uh, beginning from my left, um, Dr. Haugen, Dr. Ian Hay, our uh, expert thyroid endocrinologist, thyroid cancer endocrinologist, and then our surgeons, uh, Dr. William Inabnet uh, and Dr. Dave Stewart, uh, who will help us uh, go through the cases that you will be, that you submitted and Steph and I uh, worked with to put them in an order that uh, we thought most uh, reasonable. And uh, we'll begin with uh, Dr. Zhang, who I will ask to come up and present the first case. Oops. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is She Yen. I'm from the United Kingdom, and uh, I work for an institute called Northern Center for Cancer Care. Um, Newcastle, the town or the city itself, locates in the northeast part of the United Kingdom, and uh, it was famous for its shipping industry and coal mining industry. However, I'm glad to say that none of these things are being made or built in my city, and it is quite beautiful, tranquil um, place, and you're welcome to visit. It's famous for its football and also its brown air. I'm saying this because it's also relevant to my case. But before that, I'd just like to say a quick word to say thank you for ATA to give me this opportunity uh, to present here and to participate in this uh, a great educational opportunity. My case is about a 70-year-old man. and He has neck swelling and fatigue presented in 2009. So he went to, well, he has a little background of uh, shipyard working in his early days and some past medical history of uh, cardiac disease, a bit of a back pain, and also pleural plaques. He takes all the secondary preventative medication, including statin, PPI, in the form of lansoprazole and aspirin. He's a non-smoker and he doesn't drink excessively, and he has no family history of thyroid cancer. He saw a surgeon and they did several biopsy, and as we learned from the past few days, this can sometimes be unhelpful. So he went on, had surgery, and the surgery was suggestive of a Herthoth cell carcinoma at 43 millimeters, and also um, had a background of lymphocytic thyroiditis. This was stage T4. He was doing well post-surgery and no problems. And then he had thyrogen iodine ablation in February 2010, and he had a scan seven days later. As you can see, this, sorry. Anyway, it's on your book. <laughs> you can see in the scan. I would just like to ask what abnormality can you see in the scan? None of these questions are trick questions, by, by, by the way. Why, and the, why don't we take a break and let the panelists sure. say what they think at this point? Well, good morning. Um, it, first of all, I think it's a, this is a great session, excellent turnout, and we're really glad you're all here and we're all pleased to be here as well. Um, I think this first case, um, as a surgeon, I'll talk from a surgical perspective, um, is that of a Herthel cell cancer. And there's several considerations that, as surgeons, we take, take into consideration. Number one, um, as, as you all know, um, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to arrive at a diagnosis of Herthel cell cancer um, on a preoperative FNA uh, or on a frozen section. Um, so there's some things that when we counsel patients that have a Herthel cell neoplasm, um, on their preoperative FNA that um, we discuss with patients. So, for example, um, are you going to do a lobectomy, a diagnostic lobectomy, or a total, total thyroidectomy? And I think if the other side of the gland is completely normal, um, we will usually err on the side of doing a lobectomy. There are some exceptions to that rule for very large um, nodules. Um, some use four centimeters. This was 43 millimeters, so it fell into that category. Um, or some use six centimeters. So for the very large unilateral herpal cell neoplasm, um, some surgical teams would recommend total thyroidectomy for those cases because the incidence of cancer is somewhat higher. 
um, the bigger the lesion. Um, and as far as the preoperative assessment, um, we would recommend um, laryngoscopy um, for big lesions like this as well. And um, we also would do an ultrasound um, as part of the preoperative um, uh, planning process. Just uh, briefly, I agree with uh, Barry. If the um, FNA was repeatedly non-diagnostic, I think uh, hemithyroidectomy for diagnosis would be the obvious choice. Whereas if that were more of a indeterminate possible Herthel cell neoplasm in an older male with a large tumor, I think consideration for a total upfront would be reasonable, though not um, absolutely uh, necessary. And it does seem like we see these Herthel cell neoplasms in the presence of thyroiditis. Um, more often than we do otherwise, so that's not a big surprise. But I think I'll defer to my endocrine colleagues regarding the uh, interpretation of the radioiodine scan. Uh, it's much too long since I didn't sit the board, so the president will deal with the scan part. So I'm going to talk about the repartee part. Uh, to continue the brown ale story, it was beer she was talking about, brown ale from Newcastle. Not only did Newcastle bring you good football and a fine river, it's just south of Glasgow, which is a wonderful place to visit. But Newcastle also brought us Reg Hall and Thyroidology in northern Britain, and it's the home of Sting, the great poet and songster. But be that as it may, uh, we're talking today about a 70-year-old 4-centimeter tumor. Now, if I was from Michigan and was one of Norm Thompson's alumni, I would say, don't believe the pathologists because they're hopeless in Michigan, nice men though they might be. If it's three centimeters plus and you're 70 years of age, it's cancer and foolproof otherwise. And if you were in Thompson's world, you would do a total thyroidectomy right away. And for 10 years, there was drama in the endocrine surgical world about three centimeters or above. It's a bit like adrenal tumors. If it's big enough, it should be malignant. But you know, we come from the frozen north of America and we invented frozen section. And if people had frozen section, or shall I say pathologists that are willing to put their reputation on the line, you would know when you did your lobectomy you've got a cancer and you do one operation and it would cause the National Health Service half the amount of money and half the possibility of morbidity. But recognize that this fascinating tumor is one that very few people around this table have written a series of 250 cases of it because this is a rarity. I mean, I've got a, a database of 3,200 patients with papillary thy thyroid cancer that only have 157 cases of Hertel cell cancer over 70 years at the Mayo Clinic. So there's nobody who's a genius around this table. This is a tricky disease that's ill understood. But I'd have to suggest to you at the time that molecular biology is talking about a mistake in an amino acid, most of these Hertel cell cancers have the chromosomal constitution of a chimpanzee or an, or an animal short of an ant. Because if we are born around here with 40 plus chromosomes, many of these heart cell cancers don't have just a missing something. They've got half the genome missing. But what's more fascinating is that a heart cell adenoma, which is eight times more common in North America than a heart cell cancer, has a worse looking DNA than a breast cancer or colon cancer. So there's still a lot to be learned about heart cell cancers. But with that preamble and a push for frozen section, which would help these patients, we'll move to the scan expert. What do the black spots mean, Lou? Is it the solar system or is it a radioiodine scan? So after all that, I'll try to answer the questions that are posed before us. And, I, and one thing I, you began with, there are no trick questions. I'm sorry, with my esteemed colleague next to me, every question is a trick question. So, um, but, but obviously, with Herthel cell thyroid cancer, as Dr. Hay pointed out, this, this is a, a, a rarer cancer, more aggressive cancer. We need to be thinking about a number of things as this patient comes in. One thing, two things I'm concerned about before I see anything else is lymph node involvement in a patient like this, persistent disease, and the tumor marker thyroglobulin is actually quite good in a patient like this. The other thing um, that we need to remember, and many people have said, is that radioiodine is somewhat less effective in Herthel cell carcinoma, which can be true, but does, that doesn't mean we shouldn't consider using it. The whole idea is if it concentrates it, there's a potential it could treat. So in a patient like this. So with that said, the abnormalities in the, or the above scan that I sort of see here is a planar image. And obviously on the left-hand side is the lower uh, exposure and a higher exposure on the right-hand side, anterior and posterior. What you see is uh, in the head, to me it looks more like physiologic uptake uh, that I see in the head, which, which would be salivary, which would be nasopharyngeal. Um, I don't 
On the, on the more uh, intense scan, anteriorly, I do see some uptake in the thyroid bed region. We don't know exactly where that is in this planar image. There's uptake in the liver, which does not mean METs in the liver. This means that whatever is being processed is being cleared in the liver that we see. There's also GI uptake. But there are a number of spots that look somewhat abnormal, some in the lower chest, some potentially in the abdomen. And it's difficult to see on a planar image exactly what that is. Many of us are using now SPECT CT imaging, where you can combine CT along with this um, to basically look for uptake. And is it pathologic or is it um, a nonspecific uptake? Uh, so would I administer repeat therapeutic iodine? No, not immediately in something like this. We, we can use diagnostic radioiodine to say, is there disease that could be treated with more radioactive iodine? And then again, the possible causes, there could be some nonspecific uptake. We can't tell from this planar imaging, but obviously, especially if we put it together with a thyroglobulin, I would be very, if a, we had a high thyroglobulin, I would be worried that there is uh, significant disease there. Um, and then the next step in investigation, I guess we go for the spiral CT, since that was what you're, uh, what you're doing next. Is Again, we would at our institution now do a SPECT CT. So we would have the two together on a patient like this. One additional comment. Is this, is this yeah. um, so I'll draw your attention to a paper by Sally Carty um, that was published um, earlier this year on communication or um, interoperative, perioperative communication about thyroid cancer. And um, as an endocrinologist at an institution, you're going to know your surgeons and you're going to know sort of how they report disease and whatnot. But this just underscores the importance of getting that information from your surgical team. Because if you're referred this patient from another institution and you don't know the surgical team, this could very well be an incomplete resection. So you need to look very carefully at the operative report and you also need to have a very careful um, dialogue with the surgical team to understand what happened in the operating room. So, for example, was the capsule of the gland violated? Was this an incomplete resection? Um, because this could all be in the differential diagnosis of what's being seen um, in the head and neck area. That being said, if it's a complete resection, then I, I agree, Dr. Haig, this is probably just physiologic uptake in the pharyngeal area. Can I ask a couple of things? It's troublesome to me that this surgery results in an NX category. And it's a pity, I think, that the patient had two surgeries to determine that it was fertile cell cancer. Now, I think a 70-year-old with a 4.3 centimeter fertile cell cancer has a fair chance of having local disease in terms of regional involvement. And it wouldn't surprise me at some point, we give all the radioiodine in Newcastle and there's still a three centimeter chunk left in his neck. Now, I know that north of the border and south of the border in Britain, there's not a lot of ultrasound, but do you have ultrasound availability? Yes. And is that available in this case or uh, not? Not in this case. Now, is there a thyroglobulin available at the point oh, of this thyroglobulin. scan? Thyroglobulin, I was going to say that was not elevated. And was the antibody positive? No. That's surprising, isn't it? Uh, so you believe the thyroglobulin and he's not a big thyroglobulin maker and the first thyroglobulin you have is at the time of withdrawal three months later I mean as a caveat I would suggest to people in this audience that there's a lot to be said when you've got a cancer on day one to get a thyroglobulin on day one to know where you're starting from because this guy on page three might have a thyroglobulin of 6800 or he might have a thyroglobulin of one and if he's got a thyroglobin and one he's dying of disease, it means the thyroglobin can be thrown out the window, which is what endocrinologists should learn quite early. But if it's 6,800, it's a triumph if we get him down to 3,000 in three years' time. And although Brian has said, you know, this is a disease that's bad and aggressive, if you follow heart to cell cancer and superimpose it on follicular thyroid cancer and you go out in a 71-year-old or a 68-year-old, 5, 10, 20 years, you're more likely to be knocked down by a corporation bus in Newcastle than to die of heart cell cancer. But if you live to your 90, you may die of heart cell cancer. But in the first 5 to 10 years, when we've looked at heart cell cancer compared with follicular of equal stage and age, it's not as bad as people paint it. And when, when Brian says, look in the textbooks, talk to the older guys in the society, at the Mayo Clinic, they didn't even do radioiodine scanning in heart cell cancers because they knew it wouldn't work. We've had patients who've had radioiodine uptake in lungs, radioiodine uptake in the neck, radioiodine uptake in bones in people you would never predict. So remember that it's almost never 100% heart cell cancer. There's always some follicular component, and sometimes that can be induced or stimulated to take up radioiodine. And although I'm not a great believer in therapeutic radioiodine, we give old ladies cuties and we give innocence nothing. 
And I think this patient might mop up radioiodine for a while, but then you'll have to deal with the disease that you may have to chop at or target with other lesions, I think. Can one, I yep. make one more I agree with what you said on the NX. I think that that's often uh, overused and abused. Um, you, know, you clinically stage the patient as well. So if you don't have an ultrasound and the surgeon didn't find any nodes uh, grossly positive and you don't palpate any nodes, you can still call it an N0. Okay. I think the distant metastases, you know, ultimately you need to um, use something, whether it's styroglobulin or, or imaging. But I do think ultimately, you know, come down on the side of the fence of N1 or N0, but don't stay on the top of the fence at NX. And Brian, I agree with you on the spec CT uh, with the um, radioiodine scans being really helpful. But that abdominal sort of uptake that you see that's not GI, if you suspected that was sort of iliac crest, I mean, what would you do? I know we're going to see a chest CT, but that one little spot as I'm looking at um, on the yeah, right gen gener quad. generally in the abdomen when we see uh, individual spots like that, one thing we consider doing is actually bringing the patient back because sometimes it's just moving. It, it can be an intense spot in the gut moving. If, in fact, you bring them back and you repeat it and it has not changed at all, then I'm more worried about it being something anatomic um, in that patient. But whatever it is, it's taking up radioiodine, if, even if it's in the gut or if it's a metastasis. Okay, that's a good point. And although I don't want to completely expend the British pound at the Northern Centre for Cancer Care, this is a good case for a PET scan. I mean, I think PET scans are grossly overused in this country, but we published in Heart and Cell Cancer and they light up like a torch. I mean, whatever's in these interested Ashkenazi cells and mitochondrial filled cytoplasm, it really eats up FDG. And I think in this case you want to know early on are you dealing with lung mats, bone mats, brain mats, spinal mats? Is he doomed in six months, and is he for the hospice? Or are you going to spend the next six months trying to whack away to keep him till he's 75? It's a challenge. But most of these people live with their disease despite their hideous metastasis. Thank you for the panel. Uh, great comment. I'm going to bring some of these suggestions back to my institute and um, hopefully we'll learn something. Just about spiral CT or SPECT CT, I think Dr. Hayes mentioned about um, National Health Service. For those audience who doesn't know what it is, uh, that means a free treatment for all, um, but does have caveat. That means we have to go from what's the cheapest means of investigation, and um, SPECT and PET uh, are available but only on selected patients and cases. Not that they've got anything against shipyard workers, but no. There are more important people. <laughs> so the next uh, uh, step of investigations, he did have a CT. And my questions are, what did the CT show and how would you manage this patient this patient now. Should I go back to the panel? So the CT that we see up there, I think obviously we only see these two cuts, but there are some potential abnormalities that we see on both cuts with uh, inappropriate sized oh, lesions out here in the periphery, potential lesions, and this is, again, potentially lesions here. You like to go through a few cuts to sort of see what you're dealing with, but these look like they are potentially lung metastases, and again, if you did a SPECT CT, they maybe would correlate with the radioiodine uptake. Um, so it, it, it looks like there's a good chance, especially if it correlates with the radioiodine uptake, that he has pulmonary metastases. I would be surprised, though, with a negative thyroglobulin globulin, with positive radioiodine uptake in a Herthel cell carcinoma, I would be a little more concerned that maybe the antibody is not that sensitive and there may be some interference because to have a non thyroglobulin globulin producing Herthel cell carcinoma that concentrates radioiodine, it's probably reportable. Um, it's very rare. Uh, I would also like to come back to Dr. Hayes' point in a patient like this we need to think a little more oncologically with 
someone now with pulmonary metastases and a Herthel cell carcinoma, and doing a PET scan early can tell us a number of things because some patients have radioiodine positive tumors and a series of PET positive tumors that are radioiodine negative. And it would be good to know that because if we have a few radioiodine positive tumors, but a number of serious PET positive radioiodine negative tumors, multiple doses of radioiodine may help those few tumors that concentrate it, but may not help this patient. So as far as further staging and understanding, um, I, I would agree that we would probably do a PET CT early on, and I'm a little leery of that thyroglobulin based on what I see on the CT. Dr. Hick, is it possible, because the pathology shows this to be a minimally invasive Herthel cell cancer, so one question is, how common is metastases with minimally invasive peripheral cell cancer? And secondly, could these lung lesions be other types of pathology? Well, the fact that I think there's a smidgen of evidence of uptake in the lung, a radioiodine would probably be as good as a biopsy to suggest that there's no two diseases here and the poor bugger hasn't got prostate cancer, melanoma, in addition to what we're talking about today. So I presume, let's assume for a minute we're lumping and he's got one disease. Um, you know, I think... If I revert to my former life in the barefoot doctor situation of Britain and you want to save money, ultrasound is pretty cheap. But what I'm eager to know, because heart cell cancer more than any other type of malignancy of the thyroid comes back in the neck more than anywhere else eventually. We've operated on people three, five, seven, nine, ten times over 20 years for heart cell cancer recurrent in the neck. So it's all very well to get focused on something silly like this old non-smoking shipyard worker with spots in his lungs. He's not going to die of that. But it's going to be an era of fascination for the doctors of Newcastle for two years until it goes away. But what is interesting is, I bet you if you did a hand count here, how many people in this audience have a nuclear medicine department that quantitates uptake when they do a radioiodine scan? Now I'm talking about, like Graves' disease, saying this patient has 3% in the neck, 2% in the left lung, 1% in the right lung. Still the same hands? I'm not so sure now. Because if you look around North America, perhaps Canada's different. Almost nobody in North America quantitates uptake. They take a picture which you can vamp up with your television volume until it looks like a big deal. But if this guy has 0.1% in his left lung and 0.2% in the right, you could take all the radioiodine in Hiroshima and it's not going to make any difference to this lung med because it's gross, it's big, and it's not going to take up much radioiodine despite us demonstrating that there's a smidgen. I mean, I'm into impressionist prints, but I mean, there's not a lot of uptake in that chest. If you took, like Martha Zaga this morning, 10 nuclear medicine specialists and showed them these pictures and said, is that lung uptake? Is that lung uptake? Well, I'm not sure. Intra-observer error. I mean, this is not like a 15-year-old with papillary cancer with two black lungs. This is a speckly chest. And if you quantitate that, it's a small uptake. And 100 millicuries, if that's what that is, is going to go in and out this man's bladder like a yo-yo, not quite a uh, boomerang, but it's going to do nothing for these lung mats. So in the end of the day, you're going to end up giving radioiodine, radioiodine, no more uptake. What do we do next? Poison them to death with an expensive kinase inhibitor that Newcastle can't afford? Or go back to what's going to kill him. The disease that was left behind in the neck is going to choke him to death. He's going to wake up one night and die because we haven't looked at his neck. Or he's got something in his cervical spine. He's going to wake up and end up in a wheelchair. Or, we never ask the questions, a brain met that we don't know about yet that's really three centimeters and isn't giving him an epileptical problem yet. But, I mean, these people die of strange things eventually, but one should not forget what's going on in the neck. And what I'm saying is if you give 100 millicuries, to me... This patient doesn't need ablation. I'm inclined to remember a Monty Python sketch, but you don't need a doctor, nurse, you need a plastic surgeon. You don't need ablation in this disease. This man has a four centimeter cancer. He needs therapy. Is 100 millicuries therapy? In Washington, it's an ablative dose. In Colorado, it might not even be an ablative dose. 150 millicuries is given for nothing in America. 200, 300 might be something. And if Ken Ain was still a fellow out there, he'd be giving 527.7 millicuries based on a physical chemical principle. So what I'm saying is you need a lot to get to the target here. And I fear at the end of the day you won't get much uptake that's going to change the CT scan. And if we're now into 2012 and you've got three more CTs, I bet you it's not shrinking and disappearing. <laughs>
But what you need to worry about, if you can't afford a PET scan, or the government won't pay for it, get a bone scan. Get a bone scan now to find out that the patient doesn't have 10 METs that are going to be much more problematic, because the lung METs he'll live with, but the bone METs and the brain METs he may die of. And the only thing I'd add to that, I, I agree again, you can look at other modalities, especially depending upon what's available and what you're able to do. And a bone scan is reasonable. That said, the sensitivity of a bone scan in a number of patients with thyroid cancer and bone metastases is actually fairly low. If you can, if you could afford it, I still would go with the PET scan. But if you couldn't get a PET scan, a bone scan is not unreasonable, just as Dr. Hay pointed out, because these are the things we're worried about in a patient who may have a bone met that could fracture, a bone met in the axial spine that could cause neurologic damage. Um, but it is a fairly low sensitivity in the, in the bone scan. I'd like to echo what Dr. Hay said about the propensity for neck uh, recurrence in these, in these folks. Um, and it's, it's unique. It's very different than the papillary carcinomas, which almost always occur in the nodes. It seems like most of these Herthel cell carcinomas, they're dermal metastases, they're, they're extranodal metastases, so they're almost like distant metastases that are occurring uh, local regionally in the neck. And fortunately, very few people die of thyroid cancer, but those that do, somewhere around half we lose control locally. So for the surgeons, I think you have to understand that even with pulmonary metastases, your job is to protect the airway. You know, that's the goal. It's not so much worrying about a lateral neck node as making sure you keep that central compartment safe uh, from invasive disease. Sure. I would just like to close by saying that we did bone scan, which was negative, and all other modality of localizing imaging, um, we are regularly following up this man. And three years down the line, he is alive and well and showed no signs of recurrence, um, which is a good news. Um, but all points taken. So just to summarize quickly, this case really illustrates that, you know, whole body scan is not um, uh, something that, um, you know, anything showed up would be definitely indicative of metastases. And many literature has uh, reported false um, positives. And I have listed on the reference, but this one reference come from Dr. Hayes' hometown, Glasgow, um, written by the man of Carlisle, published in Nuclear uh, Communication in 2003. This paper has given a great comprehensive list of uh, um, review on this method, and uh, there, is a, there was a table listing the lung metastases, um, sorry, lung abnormal scans um, showing all sorts of possibilities, including other type of primary lung cancers. So that's it. And uh, just by saying that I am a um, first year fellow in clinical oncology, so I'm no nuclear medicine specialist, but I'm really glad that I have a full panel to help. Thank you. As we set up the microscope for the next case, may I just remind you about uh, nomenclature. If endocrinologists are going to go into thyroid oncology, let's be sure that we speak the right language. Now, there's a word that not many endocrinologists use called local-regional, and it's a mixed bag of local and regional. And what my surgical colleague was saying and what I'm saying is that heart cell cancer is probably the cancer that gives you more trouble with so-called local recurrence than any other. And I mean by that recurrence outside of the node. Now, bread and butter for all of you in this life is going to be stage 1 papillary cancer that lives in nodes, don't die from nodes, and is a damn nuisance from nodes. But heart cell cancer comes back outside of the thyroid bed, in the thyroid bed, and it's a nasty thing and it grows, not like wildfire, but it grows to two, three, four centimeters and requires surgeons to go back in and back in and back in. And I don't think any kinase inhibitors make them shrink and disappear. So I think we're still going to be carving raw meat out of heart cell cancer necks and old men for a long time to come. And I don't think we're very inventive at treating this disease, but it's not quite as bad as it's painted in the literature. Just because it didn't take up radioiodine doesn't mean that we can't do anything about it. You can still treat 
and have these people survive for a long period. Next case. Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Badr Ibrahim. I'm a fourth year medical student at McGill University. And I'd like to thank the, the chairs of the session and the panelists to, for being here today for this uh, educational opportunity. So, oh, okay. So the case I'd like to present to you today is uh, the case of an 85-year-old woman um, who presented to the uh, dysphagia clinic at the Montreal General Hospital. Upon her request, she had long-standing dysphagia, and she was referred by her medical oncologist. So a quick word on her past medical history. She had a unilateral vocal cord paralysis, for which she had a vocal cord implant, some work in the, in the glottis in 2009. She had a stage 4 uh, non-small cell carcinoma, um, treated with combination of, of carboplatin and gemcitabine. Um, that was diagnosed very recently uh, before that, and she, was, she, she presented the first time at the hospital at the Montreal General in, in May, and she, we started discovering her medical issues at that time. Um, she had hypothyroidism diagnosed in 2007 and arthritis. So on the 29th of August, she presented to the dysphagia clinic, mostly for dysphagia, and we noticed on physical exam that she's tachypneic and um, she, had, she had biphasic strider, most, but mostly on expiration. Uh, on exam, you had two, two nodules in the left thyroid. Um, and so we decided to go to do a tracheoscopy and her tracheoscopy showed an 80% decrease in the diameter of the subglottis area due to a mass effect and some, some ex exophytic mass in the trachea. Um, so at that time, we reviewed quickly whatever imaging we had on that day, and we had a CT, uh, CT chest that was done on, on August 27th because she was followed by the oncology clinic for her a small um, lung cancer. Um, and the CT that we have here just shows you I mean, it, was, it wasn't a CT neck, it was a CT chest, so we don't have the whole, all, all of the slides, all, all of the cuts, but I think you can see if I can manage to bring this down here. Yes. You can see, especially on this cut here, um, that this mass is clearly invading and, and decreasing the, the area, um, the diameter of the, of the trachea. So there was also a PET scan from April 26th that showed a hypermetabolic left thyroid focus with an SUV of 13 and, uh, and some nodes that had, that had a similar intensity in the, uh, some, some juggler nodes that had similar intensity. Now, I, I looked up quickly at the oncology clinic notes. At that time when they noted it, they, they thought that they would proceed with um, treatment of her lung cancer and later investigate the thyroid thyroid issue. It turns out the thyroid issue came back faster than, than they had thought it would. So the action that we're taking on that day was to do a FNAC. We had, we had no pathology on, on her. And she was admitted for urgent thyroidectomy. So the interest of this case, I think, one of the big interests of this case is in the surgical procedure. We, we took her to the OR and um, we decided to proceed with left hemithyroidectomy and central compartment dissection and we had consented her for possible tracheostomy, as we didn't know, well, we had no idea of the extent other than this, this, these slices that you see here. Um, what was interesting is on intubation, when we tried to pass uh, the, the tube in, the six millimeter tube didn't even pass through the glottis. We had, we had to force the six millimeter tube through her glottis. So it, was, it gave you an, an idea of, of the extent of the, um, of the blockage in her trachea. So we did, intubation went more or less well, um, after which we'd, we had to use an uh, esophageal bougie, which proved to be a very good instrument in our, in our case, and I'd like the panelists and the, the surgeons, especially the panelists, to give us their advice on their approach and their technique for extensive, uh, extensive disease like this and for attempts to resect uh, extensive, extensive disease. Because the main, the main problems here that we encountered, and maybe the surgeons can elaborate a bit on this, is that in, in doing such a resection, you're trying to avoid, um, well, we were trying to avoid any perforation, anything, but the anatomy was so dis disrupted. I, I think I have a picture here, and the picture I took is at the point where we had the maximal visibility. This is, so um, unfortunately the picture is very limited too, but the best we could, we could do was identify trachea and esophagus, and esophagus was only identifiable because of the bougie. So at this point, I don't know if the panelists, the surgeons have any comments on uh, 
surgical technique and approach to extensive sex abuse. I'll start with it. This is a very difficult case, and I think there's some tremendous teaching points, but I'm not sure that they would make much difference for the patient, depending upon what the pathology turns out to be. So the first question is, 2009, she gets a medialization procedure for a left focal cord paralysis. Why did she have the left focal cord paralysis? And perhaps that would have been an opportunity to diagnose this tumor earlier. Once you're at the point where she's got strider and obvious, it sounds like to me, invasion of the trachea, not just compression with an exophytic mass that is seen involving 80 percent of the trachea, I think she's going to need to go to the operating room, but I might try to make the diagnosis with a bronch and a biopsy, hoping that this is going to turn out to be a lymphoma, because then the prognosis is actually still very good for the patient. And if you do the biopsy and send it for frozen but also flow cytometry, you may be able to discriminate anaplastic or poorly differentiated thyroid malignancy from a lymphoma, the latter with a much better prognosis. So I probably wouldn't go into the neck first. I would go into the airway first. And if it looked like a lymphoma, we've been able to just debulk the tumor through the bronchoscope, and the patients actually have done quite well with chemo and radiation. If it turns out to be anaplastic, then I think I would not even attempt to debulk the tumor and rather perform the tracheotomy, because the patient has significant airway compromise. You can't just leave it there. You need to do something, assuming that's the patient's wish. And then the worst-case scenario from a surgeon's perspective is that it's neither of those two, and it turns out that it's a well-differentiated or an insular-type carcinoma where we are more obligated to try to resect the tumor. And I think the bougie to identify the esophagus is very helpful. I would, you know, think about possibly doing a tracheal resection if I was able to actually resect this tumor. It sounds not surprisingly like you were unable to adequately resect it and, you know, were forced to do the tracheotomy. I think avoiding the contralateral side, especially without a definitive diagnosis, is a very reasonable thing. But I would have probably just gone for the diagnosis through the bronch and the frozen. And I don't know, Barry, do you have some comments? Yes, very challenging case. I think one consideration is the patient's age. She's 85, and that needs to be taken into consideration in the do-no-harm aspect of how we treat patients. I agree with most everything Dave said, but a couple additional details. It seems unlikely to be a lymphoma because, number one, it's very small and it's unilateral, and often lymphomas are very bulky and often bilateral with evidence of adenopathy elsewhere. It's certainly in the differential, but it's less likely. It seems that on your cross-sectional imaging, if you go back to the CT scan and look at the third cut, the nodule or cancer appears to be very high in the gland, really near the insertion site of the left recurrent laryngeal nerve. So it's also unlikely this is probably going to be an anaplastic because more than likely this patient had this in 2009, and patients with anaplastic cancer do not live beyond two years. So it's in the differential because papillary or well-differentiated cancers can de-differentiate into anaplastic, but it's also less likely to be an anaplastic. If this patient were otherwise quite functional, I would strongly consider a tracheal resection as the index procedure, but you do need very careful information before embarking on such. I agree with the bronchoscopy. It's easily done in the operating room, and often you'll see a fungating mass coming through the trachea, and you can also gain additional information on the degree of tracheal involvement, which will influence whether or not you do a sleeve resection of the trachea or if it's actually penetrating deep into the trachea, which I suspect on your imaging studies that this tumor is, you're going to have to do a complete tracheal resection with reconstruction. And then I would also consider a rigid esophagoscopy in this case. You're absolutely right that the esophagus is to be avoided at all cases. If you get into the esophagus in these cases, there's no recourse, and I think a gastric pull-up is overkill in an 85-year-old patient. So if there were esophageal invasion, then I think you would go more down the palliative route. But if the esophagus were clear and a high-definition CT scan usually gives you that information, but rigid esophagoscopy at the time of your operation also is important for planning, that may influence your aggressiveness of the operation. So in this case, I would propose that this is probably 
a uh, well-differentiated cancer that's at the insertion side of the nerve that's grown into the airway, and I would favor be leaning more towards tracheal resection in this patient. Question. When you're talking about stage four non-small cell cancer, and this poor lady who doesn't look very well to me, one week ago was being given chemotherapy. For what has she been given chemotherapy, and where is the primary of this non-small cell carcinoma? Is it lung? It's, yeah, the primary is in, is in the lung. She was, she was followed from... On the her, basis of a bronchoscopy? No, or, she, had, she was followed a few Or months. spit? Uh, she, she had a few months prior to that she presented at the ER. That's how she was brought into the oncology clinic, presented to the ER with shortness of breath. They, had a, they did a, an aspirate. She had a pleural effusion and aspirate, and that's how they diagnosed her. So she has a definite, on paper, bronchogenic cancer. Yes. And if she was my granny at 85 and she came in choking in the night, I might not have invited the ER physician and the medical student to take him to surgery in the night. I'd probably keep her calm and collected until she died. But on the other hand, we're very anxious to know, is it time enough for us to know what the pathology was on the day? So, so yes, we did, we did uh, send it, everything to pathology, and now we have the results that came out just a week ago. Um, so on the, on the resection, so the pathology showed papillary carcinoma with tall cell, uh, tall cell uh, histotype. Um, there was, there was, so let me, let me read you exactly the pathology report. She had, um, so what's the prognosis of her lung cancer? Her lung cancer doesn't have a, a very good prognosis. I don't, I don't. Well, should she not have been left alone unless she's going to choke to death? The, fa <laughs> the, the family, so her, her daughter was present that night and she insisted that we should, we should go ahead with maximal therapy and the outcome of all this story after the, after the operation, uh, I saw her just about a week ago before coming I want to discuss a bit with her and uh, functionally before this she was she was good she was she had a she was a, good, a functional lady and she, after the operation she was still doing pretty good after after her uh, uh, obstruction was relieved now it's true that there was some, some issue as to whether we want to sort of, uh, continue therapy and go to such invasive therapy but I think we're uh, we're influenced more by the family member and the desires of, of the family member to and is the 85-year-old lucid enough to say what she wants? She's, she's, uh, she has completely all her, her, her head is entirely there. She's capable of taking decisions. I would add at our institution, we have a very um, complete, outstanding palliative care team who are experts um, in dealing with end-of-life um, issues. And um, when we consult them, they help the clinicians interface with the family and arrive at these difficult decisions. So I would also strongly consider looking at the overall picture, like Dr. Hay has mentioned, with this with this patient who has a poor prognosis, uh, but yet needs to be palliated uh, for her airway issue. Yeah, no, I I agree. You know, this is a patient where not necessarily making this die. Obviously, the pressing issue here is airway management in this patient, and and. Um, you know, the idea of a patient potentially choking to death, and even with the anaplastic stories, stories that we have, you know, putting in, protecting the airway, putting in a tracheostomy is not always the right thing to do in some of these patients, but, you know, palliating. The big thing, I guess, the fine needle aspiration being done, likely if that was in the right place, we could have made a very quick preoperative diagnosis on cytology. Was that... Was the cytology result back before the surgery? No. At the time when, when, I, when I came to the OR and I spoke with, uh, with my supervisor, who was the surgeon that night, he, had, he didn't know the, the pathology yet. Because that would have been a good opportunity to, I, I think if this was a well-differentiated papillary carcinoma, you probably could have made that very quickly on the fine needle and then use that information to help guide your therapy, likely protecting the airway, potentially talking about you know, maybe even there now can be small amounts of external beam radiotherapy done to palliate some of these folks to beat this back. You know, the, again, the chances she's likely going to die of her lung cancer um, and not of this. And so what do we do to help control and, and palliate this um, in, a, in an 85-year-old with advanced and probably not fully treated uh, lung cancer? So the... Last remarks I'd like to do on this case is we, we decided that during the operation that there was some discussion as to uh, doing tracheal resection because eventually when we, when we removed the, uh, the, the bulk of the, the tumor on the left side, um, the, the trachea was obviously invaded and, and, and we, could, we could not resect it completely. So we, we went ahead into tracheostomy uh, because we were doing this in the emergency setting and we couldn't plan for a tracheal resection on, on that night. And um, we decided to send her later for uh, uh, palliative chemotherapy um, to help control her, her symptoms. 
Um, now, I don't know at this time if the panel has any more suggestion of what we can do in the in palliative setting. Is there, is there an optimal uh, optimal uh, treatment in radiotherapy for that for that kind of, for these kind of cases to prevent the uh, side effects from being too? Uh, I think that um, you've thrown in the, the towel, so to speak, on this one, right? I mean, you, you didn't adequately resect it, which I, I think is perfectly acceptable given the lung cancer and the patient's advanced age. But I agree, it, it's palliation at this point. So uh, I'm not even sure that you need to give uh, local radiotherapy given the fact that you've placed the tracheotomy. I agree uh, with Brian that you don't have to do this in everybody. If they get to the point where they're, and, and my, it's my impression, this woman was in distress, and, and so we were going to the operating room to manage the airway. Uh, and so um, in the absence of that, I think you don't have to. And, and morphine works pretty well for respiratory distress. It doesn't resolve the problem, but it takes away the distress aspect of it. Um, but in this case, I think I would be more towards hospice than, you know, additional chemotherapy or potentially external beam. I think you bypass the airway obstruction, and now it's take care of the patient. Yeah, and there are obviously different ways of using external beam as we consider even an anaplastic is there's a therapeutic approach and there's a palliative approach. So it's something you could consider palliatively in this patient, but that has its own side effects as well. And I completely agree. I think it was with Barry who said, you know, we have a very strong palliative care team as well. And I think one thing we tend to do, especially in endocrinology in these oncologic cases, is not think that way. And early on involve these folks in palliative care who can really help with decision making, with pain management, with um, uh, 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 you know, a lot of the problems both in the patient and the family. So getting palliative care, if you have that involved early, is a, is a very good thing. Thank you very much for your comments. Much appreciated. Good morning. Uh, my name is Julie Samantri. I'm from Wayne State University, Michigan. Um, I would like to thank UATA for giving me the uh, opportunity to present my case. Um, so this is a young female, a 25-year-old Caucasian female, who um, came to us after being recently diagnosed with papillary thyroid carcinoma. Her story um, is such that she presented in a thyrotoxic state, uh, presumed to be in thyroid storm at an outside institution, at which time she was hospitalized and treated for the same. Um, she was discharged on tapazole and um, somehow underwent an ultrasound of the thyroid, which revealed a 1.5 centimeter thyroid nodule. Um, an FNA of the nodule um, con was consistent with the cytology, suspicious for papillary thyroid carcinoma. Um, she never had um, a radioactive iodine uptake and scan, and um, she came to us with um, this diagnosis and underwent total thyroidectomy with bilateral prophylactic neck dissection at our institution. The final path showed it to be papillary thyroid carcinoma, classic variant, 1.7 centimeters in size, unilateral, um, unifocal as well. Um, on the left side of the left lobe of the thyroid, the margins were uninvolved and there were no in, uh, evidence of extracapsular spread. However, there was evidence of angiolymphatic invasion, and two out of four lymph nodes on the left side were positive for metastasis, um, the size unknown. Um, about four weeks of post-op, her thyroglobulin was 172 for a TSH of 36. Um, she had negative thyroglobulin antibodies, um, negative um, anti-TPO antibodies. Um, she did have positive TSH receptor antibody and TSI antibodies. Ultrasound um, of the neck um, revealed um, bilateral level four lymph nodes, which um, were most likely reactive as confirmed by biopsy. She subsequently received 77 millicuries of I-131, and um, post-therapy scan showed uptake around the area of the lymph node showed on um, the ultrasound, but no distant metastasis. A six-month follow-up ultrasound 
um, red um, heterogeneous non-specific sub-centimeter short axis soft tissue in the right thyroid bed. A diagnostic I-131 scan showed trace uptake in the central neck. Um, it was not quantified. The thyroglobulin was 27 for a TSH of 114. And um, based on the th persistent thyroglobulin and uh, possible um, the, um, unquantified but trace uptake in the neck, she received a second dose of I-131 of 50 millicuries. Approximately eight months from the second dose, she had um, unstimulated thyroglobulin um, level of 6.6 .6 for a TSH of 0.3, um, the persistent TSI titers. Um, ultrasound neck um, was essentially negative, and um, from about we were kind of delayed from the time of this um, blood draw and the uh, thyroxine withdrawal um, TSH because we're trying to get thyrogen approved. Well, she had a TSH of 117 and a thyroglobulin 17.1 um, by the same lab, negative antibodies. Um, and a diagnostic scan at this time um, showed trace uptake in the neck. Um, the nuclear medicine said it was decreased from the previous uptake, but um, there was a um, presence of neck uptake. Um, based on this, we did a CT neck and a CT thorax, um, but essentially was negative. So here we have a patient um, about one and a half years from her initial thyroidectomy um, with persistent neck uptake, stable thyroglobulin levels, um, persistent TSI titers. Um, so um, my question is, what is the significance of TSI titers in this patient in terms of persistent or recurrent disease? And um, what TSH targets should we aim at when you have persistent TSI titers? Um, I would like to ask the panel for comments, please. Okay, great case. Some several good teaching points here, and I'm going to defer the TSI titer um, question to my endocrinology colleagues to the right. But um, regarding surgery, um, first of all, there's a couple of things here. Number one, um, it's important to know that thyroid cancer can occur in hyperthyroid states. So classic teaching is that a toxic nodule, for example, is not a cancer, and that's the case. However, if the patient is hyperthyroid, you can have a papillary cancer in the setting of hyperthyroidism. So I think thyroid ultrasound should be an important part um, of the physical examination of all thyroid patients that are undergoing treatment for hyperthyroidism. Secondly, um, who performed the ultrasound? Um, was this the endocrinologist? Was it a radiologist? Or was it the surgeon? And just like you need communication between the surgeon um, and the endocrinologist when you're dealing with cancer to get the information, you need to know if you're not doing the ultrasound, who is doing that? Because there are different ways of interpreting um, thyroid pathology based on who's doing um, the study. Um, secondly, what side of the neck was the cancer in? Um, the left. The left. So in this case, um, I noted that the patient underwent <clears throat> a prophylactic bilateral, I assume central node dissection, so a level six level node dissection. Six. And that's an area of ongoing debate um, amongst uh, endocrine surgeons. Um, you know, the preference in many groups, including ours, is to do um, uh, therapeutic dissections only if there is evidence of disease in the central neck and not to do prophylactic. Um, maybe Dr. Stewart can answer, address that in a moment. Um, <clears throat> and I think in this case, um, again, looking at the lateral lymphadenopathy, um, when you do the ultrasound before your index procedure, you always want to look at the lateral neck. And if you order a thyroid ultrasound in radiology, the radiologist will not look at the lateral neck in many cases. So this should be an important part of the ultrasound evaluation of nodules is to look at the lateral neck. Um, and that's why it's important who's doing the study and what their level of expertise is regarding thyroid cancer. Um, and finally, the lymph node features, um, a 2.7 lymph node seems in itself to be quite large. Uh, it depends on the shape, the echogenicity, and the architecture of the lymph node. And even with a benign diagnosis on FNA, there are some nodes that clearly look cancerous, and I would be much more aggressive in going after to get a tissue diagnosis um, if your ultrasound features suggest cancer. Yeah, I, I think the, 
the important point here is the ultrasound wasn't done adequately preoperatively, right? So this wasn't a prophylactic. This was an undertreated patient initially. She had what appears to be bilateral uh, nodal metastases. And I suspect that the cytology, um, while it says was negative, it'd be curious to see that report, and it should have been sent for thyroglobulin, because often in cystic nodal mets, the thyroglobulin will be sky high, and you can confirm that. Um, actually, we did a thyroglobulin wash on um, one of this. Uh, we don't know how one was lost, but on one it was negative. And the first ultrasound was done um, by a radiologist at the other institution, and um, our um, surgeons usually do not do a prophylactic, but um, the surgeon said that he did not see any suspicious nodes on the right side. Um, so he, um, based on what he saw, he, um, I don't know if you can still call it a prophylactic, but he still. Um, no, I'm sure that was his intent at the time, but he didn't know about the 2.7 centimeter no, left level know four about. node. Yeah, that node's got to be pathologic. I mean, it, you just don't get normal 2.7 centimeter left level four nodes right. in somebody. So, um, having said all that, she's doing pretty well, and maybe we can hear what the endocrinologists think. Uh, we should interpret things as now? Um, as of now, because we don't have any structural evidence of disease, we just have some trace uptake in the neck, so we decided not to um, give her radioactive iodine and watch her. Yeah, that's, let's see what, Ian? Just a couple of questions first. He, he has no opinion on this case. <laughs> um, the latest flavor uh, is a stimulated, endogenously stimulated TSH in association with what thyroglobulin? What's your current thyroglobulin? The one that's called pending here. Um, oh, I have it. It's 17.1 for a TSH of 117. So a thyroglobulin is 17 with a huge TSH. Okay. And is that a concern to you and your colleagues? Um, no, actually, it's stable. It's about the same as it was um, eight okay. months back. And I don't have any structural, at least, evidence that I see. I mean, although I tend to agree with our colleagues that there's a fair chance that this patient has microscopic disease in at least one lateral node in the left side, mm -hmm. if you've stuck a needle in there, sent a TG wash, have ultrasounds that are looking better, maybe it's vanished, maybe it never existed. But if you go right back to the beginning of the story, here we have a 25-year-old lady with a colorful thyroid history who has a 17-millimeter tumor that involves two lymph nodes. Now, two years ago, I was asked to write an editorial in the World Journal of Surgery, which I titled, East versus West, Whose Policy is Best? If the patient went to the Ito Hospital in Japan, they would have a unilateral lobectomy of the left side, a central compartment dissection, and a meticulous dissection, perhaps, of the lateral neck, and she might be cured. If she came to us, she'd have a near-total thyroidectomy, a look-see at the central compartment, and we wouldn't touch the lateral neck unless our preoperative ultrasound suggested there were nodes. But in Ito Hospital and in Mayo Hospital, we would never, in a thousand years, give 77 millicuries to an innocent. And even if we did give 77 millicuries, if you weren't satisfied with 77, why would you back off and give 50? I mean, in the world of aggression south of the border here, you give 77, next time you give 127, next time you give 367, then we send them to the Mayo Clinic because they're calling the, the cops. But I mean, 77 plus 50, my question is, what are we treating? We're treating the syntogram of Dr. Sisson. We're wiping the syntographic slate clean and we may be doing diddly squat for this patient's future, except to worry our grandchildren about whether granny's going to die of radiation-associated cancer 50 years from now sure. because she probably didn't need radioiodine. She needed good surgery and good ultrasound, which can be relatively cheap if you choose your team well. Sure, I agree. Over to TSI, which I think is focus focus here. I, I told you he had no opinion. Um, no, no, so I agree. And, and, and the, again, just one point before coming to the question of the thyroid stimulating immunoglobulins um, is, again, this lymph node. When we see a lymph node that's 2.7 centimeters, and another question you always need to ask, I think Barry had brought up, is obviously the, the shape not just one dimension. You'd sure like to know what it is in three dimensions and what's the sonographic features. The other thing you want to know is where was that found in the neck. If you have a 2.7 centimeter long but a normal shaped lymph node in level two, 
that's a little bit different than something in level four. I'd be a little more worried in level four. And it sounds like these were level four lymph nodes. Level four. Yeah, and so I'd want to know, obviously, I guess this was a long, thin lymph node with a hilum? Or um, was it? They said it looked like a benign lymph node that presents a fatty hilum. Um, okay, so a long, thin lymph node with a fatty hilum. Again, even in level four, I don't know if I necessarily would have biopsied that. But it's not unreasonable to do, and plus the thyroid globulin is negative. Obviously, if it's a larger fat cystic lymph node, that's a very different, different approach. So what about those thyroid-stimulating immunoglobulins? Um, you know, the thing I think that's interesting in this patient is this TSH of 0.3 with a thyroid globulin of 6.6. .6. Then she's withdrawn, I believe, or was it thyrogen? Yes. Withdrawn? Uh, no, she was withdrawn, withdrawn. Uh, endogenous, TSH of 1. So TSH 17. of 117, and the thyroid globulin goes to 17. In general, it's not in every patient, but in general, you expect about a tenfold increase in that thyroid globulin with a big TSH rise. And I think what we're seeing actually is the TSIs are playing the role of TSH in this case through cyclic AMP, and in some in some cases, the argument is through protein kinase C and and some growth effects. So the question is, we're seeing the thyroid globulin effect of TSIs. So there could be very microscopic disease, but it, but the TG is now being driven by the TSIs even when the TSH is suppressed. So we don't want to just suppress the TSH to suppress the TSH, but in a lot of cases we do it to sort of decrease that stimulation and we're getting it through the TSIs. So do TSIs have an increased risk of thyroid cancer, say in someone with Graves' disease? The data is pretty mixed, but at least my reading of the data is no. I don't think it's an increased risk of thyroid cancer. Now, if you have thyroid cancer and you have Graves' and TSIs, is it more aggressive? Again, unfortunately, the data is fairly mixed on that. My reading of the literature is I think it could be a little bit more aggressive. And we even did a series of 100 patients where we looked at TG, TPO antibodies, and TSIs, and the TG, TPO antibodies were positive in about 20%, and three of those patients did have TSIs. Two of them had more aggressive disease. It's not a big study, but is there kind of a, a bit of aggression in a patient like this? It could be a bit more aggressive disease, but the data is, I think, still quite mixed on that. So overall, I wouldn't make a lot of the TSIs. Other than this is a patient I maybe would follow a little more closely than someone else. I wouldn't give them more radioiodine, but I would maybe monitor them more closely as potentially being a, a bit more um, aggressive disease down the road because of the TSIs. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. The case I'm going to present to you is a case of uh, an aggressive and persistent medullary thyroid carcinoma. My name is uh, Valentina Capelli. I'm uh, from Italy, University of uh, Pavia. This patient is a 69-year-old woman that came to our institute in July 2012. What we knew at that time is that uh, she was affected by a medullary thyroid carcinoma diagnosed in uh, 2008. Then we had to collect her medical uh, history and uh, it was not very simple because she had tracheostomy and so, so she had difficulties to talk and her medical documents, although being uh, really a lot, were not so exhaustive. So what uh, we were able to collect was that her personal and familiar history was negative for an endocrine tumor and for uh, other major pathologies. At diagnosis, uh, um, the patients noted the appearance of a voluminous mass at neck uh, level, and then she performed a, a CT scan that showed that this mass was larger than five centimeters, involved the left thyroid lobe and uh, isthmus, and there, all, there were also voluminous homolateral lymph node tumefaction, and uh, uh, some lymph node tumefactions were reported also in the contralateral site, and moreover, this mass uh, over extended to the major part of the surrounding tissues that were uh, infiltrated or uh, compressed. So in June 2008, uh, the patients underwent total thyroidectomy with cervical and tracheal lymph node dissection and resection of the major part uh, of uh, uh, the tissues involved. 
Histological exam was diagnostic for a medullary thyroid carcinoma spindle cell variant. There, were, there was evidence of vascular invasion, lymph node metastasis, and capsular infiltration. Immunohistochemistry was positive for CEA and CGA. Then the patient was uh, re-evaluated post-surgery. Calcitonin was uh, higher than 3,000 picogram ml, but we could not compare it with the pre-surgical value because we did not dispose of it. And the same uh, was for a CEA. And the post-surgical CT scan showed persistence of thyroid tissue, lymph node to infection, and the presence of millimetric subpleric nodules. TNM staging was the T4 and 1MO. So the patient underwent a second surgery with modified lateral cervical lymphadenectomy at left and lateral cervical lymphadenectomy at right. And we did not have a histologic exam of this second surgery. She then underwent radiation therapy all in 2008 at neck and mediastinum level, and this was uh, uh, two years later complicated by the uh, insor uh, edema of blotis. This required a tracheostomy, and the patient uh, in the future years uh, underwent the periodic infective uh, processes at, um, in lungs. Uh, the latter CT scan uh, we had uh, was in 2010, and it showed evidence of fibrotic tissue in the neck and mediastinum and persistence of millimetric lung nodularities. So in 2012, we re-evaluated this patient. At physical examination, she was in good general health and self-sufficient. She had no signs or symptoms of hypercalcitoninemia. And at next examination, we reported the known tracheostomy and uh, tissues uh, were very stiff at palpation and it was not surprising because she underwent uh, radiation therapy. Calcitonin was uh, still uh, elevated, more than 5,000 picogram ml, but the calcitonin doubling time that we calculated was longer than uh, five years. CEA was also elevated, but not comparable with previous results because we did not have them. The CT scan that we uh, performed showed multiple irregular lung nodules. We talked uh, the, uh, with the radiologist about this case, and finally, we were not able to distinguish if they were indicative of disease progression or just uh, indicative of these uh, infectious uh, processes. And it's important to note that the, the patient, uh, because of the presence of tracheostomy, underwent uh, uh, frequent uh, infectious uh, processes, and and uh, the latter was uh, one or two months ago, and the patient uh, underwent a bronchoalveolar lavage that was negative for uh, neoplastic cells. Uh, we also collected samples and sent them for genetical exam, but we are still waiting for uh, the result of it. So in summary, we had on one hand a high serum calcitonin and a CT scan suspicious for lung metastasis, but on the other hand, the calcitonin doubling time was longer than two years, and uh, these nodules at CT scan did not univocally indicate metastasis. And it's also important to remark that the patient was uh, in good clinical health. So I would like to listen to your opinion, and then I'll tell you what we decided to do. You know, the surgical opinion, especially, I guess, one of the questions I'd have back to you guys is once she's had her surgery, you know, sort of why, you know, what the cause was, obviously, of the tracheostomy to begin with, and now does she still need it? Well, this, this is a, a great real-life um, case um, with, with lots of teaching points. Um, there's some concerns, though, um, in the management of this patient. So, number one, um, why did the patient get um, a CT scan? Um, you know, typically there is also a debate about the utility of CT scanning in patients with thyroid disease, um, particularly in those who you suspect cancer. So on the one hand, if you suspect a well-differentiated cancer, you want to avoid um, a CT scan with IV contrast. And you can usually um, get information if you're worried about a substernal component without IV contrast. There are some exceptions to that rule because if you're worried about vascular invasion, um, although MRI can be very helpful, um, CT scanning can sometimes give very detailed um, vascular information that um, outweighs the iodine load that can be administered with um, 
uh, during a CT scan that could then thereafter affect radioactive iodine ablation. In this case also, um, if you have a patient with bulky bilateral nodal disease and a voluminous tumor that looks like a cancer on your imaging studies, this is the case where I would send off a calcitonin level preoperatively. It's not routinely done in the U.S., whereas in Europe it is more commonplace, but this is a case where I would send off a screening calcitonin level um, in the U.S. Thirdly, um, I see no mention of working the patient up for pheochromocytoma. So this is a patient with medullary thyroid cancer, and clearly if you have that diagnosis beforehand, you're obligated to screen the patient for pheo, and probably the most efficacious um, screening modality, uh, quick and dirty, is plasma, uh, catecholamines, and metanephrines. Um, certainly urinary studies can be used as well. If you get the diagnosis after surgery, so um, you, you know you arrive at this in your final pathology, which sometimes happens, you're surprised by the pathology, then you're obligated to do genetic testing and pheochromocytoma uh, evaluation. Um, and as far as operative technique, just a few technical pearls. If you see vascular involvement, clearly you need to be prepared, prepared for this um, at the time of your intervention. You want to have a plan in place um, before you start the operation. So if you see jugular venous involvement, we can ligate a jugular vein. That's okay. But you can't divide the carotid artery or resect the carotid artery. So if you see carotid artery involvement, clearly you know you've got a bad player and you want to have your vascular surgery colleagues on board where you might have to do shunning procedure. Again, very, very rare circumstances. And in this case of the tracheostomy, I know it was hard to take a history, but I would be very interested in knowing the family history as well. So I think, uh, and I agree with Barry on the um, on the, the routine use of CT with IV contrast. In this patient, I think that it's uh, well indicated whether or not you knew it was medullary or not uh, at the time. If you've got mediastinal and bulky um, local and um, lateral cervical disease, knowing what you have going in um, is really important. And, and, and it sounds like maybe was undertreated initially uh, with the first surgery. Um, these are patients that, that might benefit from a mini sternotomy. It's not the full, you know, crack the chest wide open for cardiac surgery, but often we get our thoracic surgery colleagues to come in and split the manubrium, and we can um, more adequately resect uh, that disease going down into the superior mediastinum, which is going to be a problem and is not well treated uh, with radiation. So I think that ideally the first surgery would have uh, more adequately addressed that, and I think that's much more important than the lateral uh, cervical nodes. I, I don't think the lateral cervical nodes are going to make as big a difference. I, obviously, we usually like to go ahead and treat them if they're clinically positive at the time of the initial surgery, but that's a less critical uh, uh, management um, issue. And um, I, I think that today's uh, radiation therapy, at least at our institution, has a lot lower complication side effect rate. Uh, maybe than five or ten years ago. I think our uh, radiation oncologists are much better. Part of it is just the imaging and the uh, computer-guided uh, sort of radiation is much better than it used to be. So we don't see as much of this uh, patient who becomes tracheotomy dependent. It is a little unusual, though, that 2010 she would have developed the obstruction when 2008 was the radiation, late 2008. It was very difficult to understand uh, the temporal sequence and why these events happened because uh, she was not followed by um, one specialist, but she went around in one hospital, then another hospital, and our impression was that nobody has collected the, the whole story yet before. And, and so she, she certainly needs a, a flexible laryngoscopy at the very least to assess whether the vocal cords uh, are functioning or whether they're fixed. Um, it's possible that um, this is radiation effect. You can have radiation uh, chondronecrosis that can essentially destroy the, uh, the larynx and result in either need for a laryngectomy or, or the, uh, the tracheotomy. Um, it's also possible that uh, the disease has now involved the, the nerves and she's got a bilateral vocal cord problem. So it would be nice to know a little more. Sometimes we, we need to go to the operating room for a direct laryngoscopy, but a lot of information can be obtained with the flexible uh, laryngoscopy. Um, when the patient was given mediastinal radiation therapy, was this because of documented bulky mediastinal nodes or was this prophylactically to the mediastinum? We didn't know. Okay. And, I mean, 
the question is, at the end of the day, how aggressively do we pursue this patient? I mean, it would be hard for me to believe that this patient with a calcitonin of 5,500 doesn't have occult distant metastasis. On the other hand, they might be able to live with them if we never discover them for many years. So at least our attitude at the Mayo Clinic would be, if you've got a patient older with no positive disease, then they've got a high possibility, despite radiation therapy at some time, there could be disease coming back in the neck. So I think it would be a no-brainer to periodically do neck ultrasound in this patient. Mm -hmm. Harmless and helpful. In terms of going beyond that, I think, you know, when I left Britain and went to the Mayo Clinic, people would cannulate people's veins from the head to the pelvis in search of, you know, calcitonin levels and where the source of the evil was. And then people at the Mayo Clinic used to do laparoscopic investigations and take snippets out of the liver. People did exotic hepatic angiograms and so on and so forth. In recent times, we follow people daily with big, big numbers, thousands or tens of thousands, and we do an ultrasound of the neck to make sure there's nothing growing. And we do a CT of the chest periodically to make sure there's nothing happening down there. In other words, we will act if the patient's airway is in jeopardy, but we're not going to go looking for somebody with occult bone metastasis, occult brain metastasis who isn't suffering from it, because we're never going to really cure this patient, and we shouldn't try to. The patient's going to live with their disease until for otherwise if all they have is microscopic disease in the chest or no disease in the chest. But all I'm saying is it's hellish unlikely that this patient can be explained with these degrees of tumor marker excess on the basis of only lymph nodal involvement until for otherwise this patient is a stage four disease. But you know, the seven patients we presented with treated with alcohol were living at 20 to 30 years post-diagnosis with outlandish thyroglobulin, I mean, uh, calcitonin excess. And to bring back logic to the ATA, I don't understand why we seasoned campaigners see people in the clinic every day with calcitonins that are ludicrous, 500, 5,000, 50,000, we say, come back in a year, you're going to be fine. But the same mindset gets bent out of shape because of a thyroglobulin of 0.2 that stimulates to 0.7 with a disease that has no mortality. This patient could have a mortality, but we ignore tumor marker excess. I don't understand what the logic is between the C cell in the right lobe and the follicular cell and the thinking of endocrinologists that they're so damned obsessed about papillary cancer and we ignore huge calcitonin excess here. And I think it's plausible, appropriate, and it's what we do at the Mayo Clinic. And we would do simple things. We would do it once a year, and she's probably going to do fine. I am just amazed at how you can take a medullary thyroid cancer case into a diatribe again on thyroglobulin. That's just wonderful. That's fantastic. Um, but I, I actually, I agree. I, I agree. I agree. And, and, and so a couple of things. One, again, and coming back to Dave's point and Barry's point before that, we do think a lot. If we have what seems to be a fairly simple potentially differentiated thyroid cancer, I totally agree we can use ultrasound preoperatively and not necessarily go to CT with contrast. These patients with more bulky disease with a, a number of these other symptoms, it's perfectly fine to do CT with contrast. We can wait the three to four months. We can measure urinary iodines if we want to use radioiodine down the road. So I think the biggest thing is to get the best information you have before surgery um, in these folks. Uh, so I, I'm it used to be the endocrinologist would always scream at the surgeons for doing CTs with contrast, but in a case like this, I think it's perfectly fine. The doubling time. So we look at the calcitonin doubling time, which is a very good predictor of aggressiveness. Now that said, most people don't start with the baseline thyroglobulin, a number due, of 3,400. You mentioned that word again, thyroglobulin. This is a medullary oh, case. Oh, I'm sorry. Calcitonin. calcitonin of calcitonin of 3,400. So, so you take both the rate of rise and the absolute, uh, absolute value. I think the other hand, we see some who come in with calcitonins of 5, and then it goes up to 10, then to 20, and then we're worried about the doubling time. So you take both of those into account. I totally agree. This is, there's likely distant metastatic disease. It may or may not be in the chest. Almost certainly there's going to be something in the liver if you look. How do we look for it? three-phase CT, three-phase uh, contrast CT, or sensitive MRI. The question comes back to is, should we? How hard should we look? Because what are we going to do about it in this case versus a standard CT looking for bulky disease in the liver? My concern would be actually in the bones. And one of the better tests now in the bones, especially for the axial spine, is an MRI uh, skeletal survey. 
And I would actually consider that in a patient like this, not to say, could I find a tiny bit of disease, but is there anything that could, if it grew, be threatening in this patient? and that we should either follow more closely or consider earlier sort of a prophylactic therapy to keep this patient from getting into trouble. Um, so th that's something I maybe would be considering in a patient like this, um, and then obviously monitoring um, the neck very carefully. But I, I suspect there's disease outside in the liver and possibly in the bones. Well, with this patient, this patient will not be cured. This is definitely not a cure. And um, there are um, um, tyrosine kinase inhibitor protocols that look at progression of disease. So if you have stable disease, usually the patients are not eligible, but uh, with progression of disease, then um, they could be offered some of the novel approaches. I, I would just like to take a, a poll. Now, let's assume this patient was diagnosed with pheochromocytoma, had, had not yet had their medullary thyroid cancer operation. How many would do the thyroid cancer operation first? Anybody? Great. Great question question. So this is a classic, you know, general surgery board question that um, when you have this diagnosis, you definitely want to do the FEO first. And the reason is uh, twofold. Number one, um, clearly the patient can have a hypertensive crisis, which can be lethal um, intraoperatively um, if you're operating the neck and you have an undiagnosed pheochromocytoma. Um, secondly, um, you do get an evaluation of the liver. So rarely you will see liver metastases at the time of your adrenalectomy, and you can do a biopsy, and that information will help direct the aggressiveness um, of your surgical therapy in the neck. So those are the two reasons. And typically the medullary metastases are in the capsule of the liver. They're not deep in the substance. They're in the capsule. They're very visible. They're small, so they're often missed on cross-sectional imaging, and they have a very characteristic appearance. And I guess just back to the idea of these newer therapies, these targeted or directed therapies, you know, n now in the United States, I believe in Canada as well, I don't know about in Europe, but as far as Vandetanib, which is now renamed as Caprelza, is available. It's FDA approved. But I think part of the point Barry made as well is we don't, two, two things about it is, is we really reserve it for patients with progressive or symptomatic disease, not for patients with metastatic, stable, asymptomatic disease. Um, and, and the other thing is, is it's, it, even though it's in a pill form, it is a chemotherapy and it does have significant side effects that need to be managed. So it's something that we always can now consider, either a clinical trial or an available therapy. And, and there are going to be hopefully other available therapies in the not too distant future. But this is something that we can reserve. And if this patient is asymptomatic, stable, even with high calcitonin, um, we wouldn't necessarily just jump to prescribing something like that for this patient. So. If the doubling time's less than two years, you're going to pull the trigger on the chemotherapeutic agents and try to stabilize it. If it's greater than 10 years, you're not. But this is five years. So are you going to refer them to the oncologist? Well, no, no. So the, the, the data, at least, is if it's less than six months, very poor prognosis. Greater than two years, actually a very good prognosis. So this patient at five years would be considered, at least by the calcitonin doubling time, to be a good prognosis. Five months to two years is sort of the gray zone. Uh, in a patient like this. So, and I, even with a more rapid calcitonin doubling time, I don't know if I would pull the trigger and put somebody on some sort of systemic therapy. I would maybe look harder for where the disease is. Um, but an asymptomatic, otherwise healthy person, I don't know if I would just for a doubling time, like they do with PSA, I don't know if I'd put them automatically on systemic therapy. And then my other question on the doubling time is, is it different if it goes from 5,000 to 10,000 versus 5 to 10? Uh, that's not the way the data has been looked at, but I believe so. That's why I say exactly. You need to look at both the baseline and the uh, uh, doubling time. Right. Just a quick comment. I mean, I, before I put this patient to sleep and bring them back every year looking with an ultrasound unthinkingly and a CT of the chest periodically, at some point I'd be curious, a bit like Brian, to know why do they have a 5,000 calcitonin once? Now, I don't know what the best way of spending euros is in Pavia, but if you don't have a good MRI you can get cheaply, PET scan isn't a bad thing in measure thyroid cancer if you really want to know what's going on outside of the areas you're going to be monitoring. And if you can't find anything, you never repeat it again unless drama occurs and you get symptomatic. But I think to put a 70-year-old, 72-year-old into a quality of life with an expensive and exotic drug that has side effects for what she's got so far would be an unkind waste of Pavian money if you ask me. Okay. 
Thank you very much. And uh, so what we finally decided uh, is that uh, this disease uh, was persistent but not progressive. And uh, on account uh, of uh, what um, uh, we heard uh, that uh, this therapy is also reserved to progressive disease and on the side effects, uh, we decided not to do nothing but just uh, follow up the patient. Thank you very much. So um, this is the second case that I have, a um, um, case of a 59-year-old man presenting with sudden onset of acute um, vision loss. So a 59-year-old male with no known medical problems, his med past medical history, family history, social history, essentially unremarkable, presented with acute onset of blurring of vision in the left eye 24 hours after he moved a heavy furniture at home. Um, an ophthalmology evaluation showed a hemorrhagic mass in the left eye overlying the optic disc with neovascularization of the retina with exudative retinal detachment. He was treated with um, Avastin and, um, and he had um, evaluation at the office. A complete review of system revealed no other symptoms other than mild low back pain. The possibility of a metastatic mass prompted an investigation for the primary. Initial workup with a PET CT imaging showed FDG avid large right thyroid mass measuring 8.1 in the largest dimension, multiple FDG avid pulmonary bilateral nodules, bony lesions in the thoracolumbar spine and in the ribs. Um, he, uh, the Left retinal mass was also FDG avid. MRI of the lumbar spine showed an intradural extramedullary mass at level 2 corresponding to the FDG avid lesion. Um, he had an MRI of the brain which showed um, an enhancing 0.8 centimeters fourth ventricular mass. This mass um, was FDG negative on the PET. Um, he subsequently underwent an FNA of the right thyroid mass, which was consistent with a Hertel cell neoplasm. Biopsy of the largest pulmonary nodule, uh, 1.3 centimeters, revealed a metastatic Hertel cell CA. Um, he subsequently underwent total thyroidectomy with substernal resection and removal of an enlarged superior mediastinal lymph node. Um, the surgeon did not identify any um, um, suspicious central or lateral compartment lymph nodes. The pathology returned as um, Hertel cell carcinoma on the right lobe with two foci, one of 7.5 and one 1.2 centimeters in the maximum dimensions um, with capsular and vascular space invasion. He also interestingly had on the other side a follicular variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma, multifocal with the largest focus of 1.3 centimeters. Um, he did have some Hertel cell nodules as well on the um, left lobe. The superior mediastinal lymph node uh, was also positive for metastatic Hertel cell carcinoma with vascular space invasion. Um, Post-op, um, he was started on levothyroxine because further procedure, procedures were planned because of the spinal lesion. Um, he underwent excision of the intradural malignant tumor um, without any complications, and the histology was consistent with the Hertel cell um, CA metastatic. Um, three weeks post-op, his thyroglobulin was 183 for a TSH of 39 and negative antibody levels. He was withdrawn from, thyro uh, from levothyroxine and um, planned for radioactive iodine remnant ablation. Within two weeks of withdrawal, he presented with complete loss of vision on the left eye. At that time, um, he was found to have um, neovascular glaucoma in the left eye, and um, the vascular metastatic mass uh, had seemed to um, increase in size by about five millimeters compared to the last imaging. 
um, he did have exudative retinal detachment as well um, that with increased um, intraocular pressure. He um, was treated with um, a Vastin injection with somewhat improvement in the intraocular pressure. Um, he was um, at that time um, offered for external radiation versus enucleation. However, we wanted to also give him a trial of radioactive iodine. Um, we were not sure because of the Hurtle cell CA. He was uh, pre-medicated with dexamethasone um, and received 152 millicuries of I-131 therapy. A post-therapy scan revealed uptake only in the neck. I apologize, I don't have the images, but there was only um, uptake in the neck and some physiological uptake um, in the salivary glands. Um, considering his eye symptoms and a radioactive iodine refractory metastatic disease, he was recommended again for external radiation versus um, enucleation of the eye mass. Um, the patient um, at that time wanted a second opinion and since then has been following up um, at University of Michigan and he's receiving um, the um, external radiation, the, I, I don't know what it is called, the precision, melanoma precision um, radiation to the left eye. He remains um, asymptomatic in terms of his other disease, but his vision has not improved. And I have not seen him over the past six months, but the, prior to six months, he did not have a recurrence um, in the neck. So in summary, a stage 4C, heart cell um, CA metastatic co with coexisting multifocal PTC on the other side and a radioactive iodine refractory disease. Um, I would like to com some comments from the panel. Shall I start? <coughs> the warm-up group. Um, firstly, I think we can forget about the papillary cancer. I mean, it's sure. fascinating but unimportant. Yes. This is much more like the old-fashioned hurdle cell cancers we were talking about earlier today. And if this man was 70, I think he's doomed. The fact that he's 59 going in 61, you know, I think it's worthwhile to give him a shot. But recognizing that he's younger than average, has more disease than the average, and this radioiodine is a joke. Meaning this radioiodine 150 millicuries is going nowhere. And this man had brain mets, he had spinal mets, He's probably got lung mats, he's got bone mats all over the shop. You either have to decide, I think, what are the battles you're going to fight, because you ain't going to win the war. And the real issue is, in a relatively young man, where is his next threat? We've lost his eyesight. We've apparently decompressed his spine for the moment. But it's a matter of time until another spinal mat comes along, and the next time the neurosurgeon's not going to be so happy going back in there. Is the brain mat needing treatment? You know, this is high drama, it's medical oncology, 301, thyroid variation, but it's tricky stuff. Yes. And I think it's time consuming, and for Mr. Romney and Mr. Obama, my dear, it's expensive. I mean, you didn't tell me he was an auto, work, auto worker with no insurance, but I suspect his bill's getting up to a million dollars now, and this is not Pavia or Newcastle. We've, I mean, even before he got to the operating room, he'd consumed a lot of the country's money. And the question really is, you know, how many millions are we going to spend here to keep him around till he's 64? I mean, I'm speaking philosophically. Now back to the CSI and the thyroglobulin. Is there any surgical points? Question for me back to Brian for the real answer. Over to no you, Brian. surgical points? No surgical points. Oh my goodness. This is beyond the surgeon's knife. It can't be cured. The surgeon did a good job. The surgeon did his job. Yeah, clearly. <laughs> his or her this job. This case yeah. is silence the surgeons. There's no teaching points. Clearly this is... Um, oh, oh a challenging case and this patient has a very poor prognosis. Um, that being said, um, there are some surgical considerations and I think that deals with the mediastinal airway disease that you know, um, we want to make sure that this patient has a protected airway. And if surgery is ever being entertained, it should not obviously be for cure because this patient is not going to be cured, but it should be for airway protection. So it may not be this patient, but I will just say that there are situations where bulky mediastinal nodal disease that's isolated in the setting of peripheral cell cancer does warrant a fairly aggressive surgical approach. So that's the one teaching point. That's not this case, but in peripheral cell cancers, that is a teaching point. 
Yes, so this is when you hear about you have thyroid cancer, you have the good cancer. It's cases like this that you that we are very circumspect about, about not telling people that thyroid cancer is always a good cancer. I think our biggest problem in general is that for a majority of the cancers, we tend to over-treat, we tend to over-monitor, and then for some of these cancers, we don't think broadly, like a team, oncologically. And that's sort of what we need to do here. And, and actually, there are, I think, are a, just a number of good points about uh, and one of them actually is when you're preparing and thinking about using radioiodine is to make sure in somebody like this with metastatic disease that places where they could get into trouble are safe. So basically doing something about the spine lesion was very good because you don't want to withdraw this person and then have them get a parasis or something like that, or a brain metastasis, a large brain metastasis, get a hemorrhage. This is what can happen. I've not seen so much with the retinal metastasis. You know, I, obviously, again, in the oncologic principle, think about other cancers. You know, it doesn't sound like this could have been a melanoma or something like that, and you can usually uh, uh, tell with those, but is in these people preparing them with something like dexamethasone is, I think, a very good idea. For our one shot at radioactive iodine, we probably would have done a dosimetric approach to decide to give a very large dose of radioactive iodine. The other principle, and I think in nuclear medicine, is sometimes you say there are no distant, metastat there are no distant metastases, but if there's tremendous uptake because of maybe an incomplete resection in the neck, remember they only scan for a certain period of time to get a certain number of counts, and if it's all in the neck, you may be missing uptake in the metastases. So there can be some metastatic uptake that we're missing early on if there's a large or star effect in the central neck. The follow-up question always is, if there's a little bit of uptake, could we get some beneficial therapy out of the radioiodine? So I definitely would be aggressive with the radioiodine up front, but be very willing to back off quickly because, you know, we're not going to cure this patient. Could we palliate? And then to look at what we talk about is aggressive monitoring versus specific therapy for um, uh, symptoms and potentially threatening disease, and then coming to systemic therapy. And if this patient has a progressive disease, is this a patient where we could consider one of these tyrosine kinase inhibitors or something, remembering that these do not, they're not cytal, they don't cure disease. What they'll do is they'll slow the progression in a number of patients and have partial regression, maybe in 20 to 30 partial response at 20 to 30 percent. So those are definite things we want to walk through. Aggressive monitoring after we do our initial therapy. Uh, can we do directed therapies via surgery, via injections, via external beam radiotherapy? And do we consider systemic therapy in a patient like this? But thinking more like a team and more like oncology. And in the same vein, I think if someone has, you know, a neurosurgical procedure to decompress one particular area of the spine, this person has a high chance of having more spinal lesions that also might require intervention. So at least in our institution, I would introduce this patient in the first visit almost to a neuro-oncologist who's willing to babysit them with me and do a better neurological examination with me and use the appropriate modalities, whether it's later gamma knife or neurosurgical intervention. So I think you need to have a neurologist with an interest in metastatic disease on board in a big center. And secondly, I think if this patient starts off with rib metastasis, 150 millicuries ain't going to go nowhere. So if you get a great big juicy rib metastasis, you might have to hack it out with a knife later, or you might have to give radiation. But there's no way that I think the modern-day chemotherapy with a 20% response is going to make great meaty tumors of the rib cage go away. So this patient has old-fashioned nasty heart or cell cancer, and he may live with it quite a long while. But this is a case where you don't say come back in six months or a year. You should be seeing this patient every three months in a multidisciplinary group yes. who look at their area of interest, orthopedics, neurology, and our little part in the system makes sure everybody turns up. Because don't kid yourselves. I mean, endocrinologists don't have a lot of tools, but we might have a brain to bring the best people to help these people mm -hmm. because radioiodine, if that's our only thing, yes. this is a water pistol against a fire in a major building, and this patient's got a lot of disease, and it could kill them eventually, but if you keep tabs on them and Detroit can afford it, you could probably keep them around with his family and grandchildren for three to five years with luck. But if you don't, you'll be dead. So our dilemma in him was, um, would you do a, like a pre-therapy scan? We don't have dosimetry in our institution, so we were forced to use um, empiric dosing. And knowing that it's a Hertel cell CA, um, we were um, kind of reluctant to give him a big dose 
um, you know, what if, you know, there's no uptake and it's not going anywhere, is it better to give a big dose up front versus giving, um, you know, a moderate dose and then uh, well, again, giving another Well, again, I think we're coming back to the no? whole issue of ablation, which we <coughs> so love and discuss and debate, which is irrelevant to this patient. And a guy who's got doomsday stage 4 heart cell cancer, you're either going to give them the big Hiroshima dose or nothing. And okay. 150 millicuries is a sort of joke dose. It's not okay. therapeutic. Okay. But although this society in North America has gone to a rather sloppy tradition of making money and doing therapy because I'm a doctor and I can bully you and we'll see where it is a week from now, we at the old-fashioned Mayo Clinic do a diagnostic scan with I-123 on every day we treat. And if this patient had nothing to treat, we would give them nothing. We would think outside the box. But if we saw something, we would hit it harder than 150 millicuries. And if we knew this person had half a percent in the neck, 2% in his ribs and 3% in his spine, we'd give him as much as we could. If know. there is, um, is there a potential that if you... But this might be a case for thyroid and stimulation, although I don't approve that drug. But, you know, you've already made him blind. Could you not have made him blind if you didn't endogenously stimulate him? I mean, this patient has to be handled carefully, but I think his radioiodine window is gone. Yes. You've blown away the few benign cells he had that took up thyroid uptake, and now we're dealing with bad stuff in bad places, and we need help. That's my bias. Small dose, uh, like a pre-therapy scan, when we use a small dose of, um, to, to the diagnostic scan, um, is there a chance um, to see probably better imaging when you use a bigger dose um, instead of doing a Pre-therapy. No, so that's a, that's a very good point when you say using a bigger dose and getting better imaging. Absolutely. But the question comes with the bigger doses, we're not simply imaging, we're trying to treat. Right. And so just because we can give more to see something, I, I think the question always comes back is what are we treating? I, I definitely would have given, this, given him a shot up front of a large dose of radioactive mm -hmm. iodine. I think the risk-benefit ratio is in his favor. Okay. But once you find if it's not useful, I would stop doing it. You mm -hmm. wouldn't just continue that. And the only other thing, obviously, we all know, but always remember, one of our best chemotherapies in someone like this is good TSH suppression. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure we can do that. And that's maybe the one thing the endocrinologist, other than thyroid hormone replacement, can do is to make sure we have good TSH suppression in a patient like this, because I think these are TSH-driven tumors. Sure. Okay. Thank you for your comments. Uh, I'm asking about uh, follicular of undetermined significant. I had, had patient have done uh, a lobectomy, it was a follicular of insignificant, uh, undetermined of significant. So the patient went for a completion of thyroidectomy. It was a, a, a negative for malignancy. Does she patient need to go for completion? Uh, does she need to have a radioactive iodine ablation? So, and maybe I'll have some questions back for you and I can let the others comment. So it sounds like a patient who had a lesion that was biopsied, cytology was follicular lesion of undetermined significance, that AUS plus category. Yeah, it's Bethesda type 4, then she had lobectomy. And what did the pathology show at lobectomy? It's still the same. I mean, uh, the, what they call the rare uh, diagnosis. So now, now we're, but it can't be a follicular lesion. of un That's a cytology diagnosis. So this is a patient who, who has a tumor, follicular lesion now of undetermined malignant potential, or UMP, as the pathologists like to call it. No, this is uh, pathology. I mean, it was reported in many cases, I mean. So final pathology yeah. is this undetermined malignant potential, follicular yeah. lesion of undetermined malignant That's right. potential. Okay, but then the patient went back and had a completion thyroidectomy? And it was a negative, I mean, on the okay. right side. Yeah. Okay, so the first debate you could possibly have is should the patient have had a completion thyroidectomy? Yes. In our studies that we looked at, the cytology, our, our expert pathologists, that follicular lesion of undetermined malignant potential, that's a pathologic diagnosis now, not cytology, basically put those in the benign category. So you could, first of all, argue that in a patient like this, you could monitor them. You wouldn't necessarily have to send them back for surgery. This patient has been sent back for surgery, now has had a thyroidectomy. Your question is, is should we give this patient radioactive iodine? My answer is I would lean heavily against giving this patient radioactive iodine. At six to eight weeks after their surgery, I would get a TSH and a thyroglobulin, because that the thyroglobulin now with the thyroid gone is going to give you some additional information. But this is not a patient that you'd want to... 
do remnant ablation because it, the likelihood that this was a malignancy is actually quite low. Okay, I don't know if others have comments. Um, in the case of a macrocarcinoma, which was treated successfully with a lobectomy, um, how would you follow the other half of the thyroid? Do you need follow-up or just... Is your question how to monitor somebody who's had a microcancer who had a lobectomy? Is that right? Um, oh, there are some who take the old literature and think, as we heard this morning, that there's not a great deal to choose in terms of outcome between lobectomy and a bilateral approach. Now, clearly, our bias at our institution is towards a bilateral approach on the basis, otherwise, you're going to be left pursuing the rest of the lobe for the rest of the person's life. So usually we do a bilateral operation. But for reasons surgeons can tell me later, we sometimes do lobectomies at the Mayo Clinic in the 21st century. And throughout the world, people sometimes do a lobectomy and it takes five days or three weeks to get the pathology back and people walk around the world with a diagnosis of papillary cancer post lobectomy. Then the issue is you can't possibly use the ATA guidelines. I mean, there's only two lines in it and 150 pages. So you have to be common sense. You have to choose, you know, different parameters. Now, if you looked at Schlumberger's work somewhere hiding in the literature or Ross McDougall's from Stanford, you're not going to look for a thyroid globin at 0.1 here. You're never going to achieve that unless you make them thyroid toxic. So some people would say, oh, a thyroid globin less than 10 is okay. A thyroid globin less than 5 is okay. What I think our society needs to recognize is that when Carl Spencer cuts down a thyroid globin level to a detection limit of 0.001, every day in America with thyroid cancer of a follicular cell origin is going to have a number. And what we'll have to recognize is that numbers that don't change, we can live with. So if you've got a lobectomy and you have a good ultrasound machine and there's no nodes left behind and the other lobe, which will become nodular, will be an area of fascination to your clinic for the rest of that poor woman's life, they're not going to be harmed by this lobectomy and the thyroglobin you'll use, but it will be detectable, and you'll have to live with it, and if it doesn't change, and the anatomy doesn't change, then maybe if Mr. Obama or Mr. whoever gets in, we send the patient back to the GP in three years saying it doesn't matter, don't spend any money except doing a thyroglobin in a neck palpation, and don't go to the ATA members again, because they're too spendy. I mean, this is minimal disease, microcancer, and it's an incidental finding, and who knows, According to my lecture this morning, I understand that half this audience might have it and not know it. So this person had a lobectomy, it's a generous biopsy, and it's probably about as efficacious as alcohol ablation, so they'll do fine. Um, I have a, um, a suggestion or recommendation, a teaching recommendation. Um, part of the things we try to teach our surgery fellows um, is how to talk the language of endocrinologists. It takes us a couple of years to do that because it's a it's a unique language, but that's part of the training of how to communicate and relay information and the terminology and the language that um, your colleagues will understand. On the flip side, I would strongly urge you to reach out to your surgery colleagues and come to the operating room and scrub on a thyroidectomy. We have a, a, at Mount Sinai, we have a rotation where the endocrine fellows come into the OR and actually, just one or two cases is all it takes, but to, to scrub in, get your hands in the operating room, um, hold a retractor, and you get a, a front row seat of what's going on. And I think that is an invaluable teaching experience for our, our endocrine fellows, and I would strongly urge you um, to do that. And I think you'll find that the endocrine surgery colleagues um, will, will be welcoming uh, that type of interaction. Okay. I just had a question about benign nodules. For example, a um, patient with a 1.5 centimeter hypoechoic nodule, regular borders, no calcifications. She's 25 and uh, no family of thyroid cancer. We did a biopsy. It was benign follicular nodules and, you know, pretty, uh, the pathologist was pretty sure there was good colloid and it was a benign nodule. Now, when do we do a repeat follow-up ultrasound on her? Because the current ATA recommendations are do it at 16 to 18 months with a B recommendation. And I asked a um, guy in private practice what we did do. He said, you know, as long as I own an ultrasound machine, I'll do yearly ultrasounds on that, you know, benign nodule. Then I asked somebody in my institution, and they said, you know, I'll just do one in probably a year, and if it hasn't changed, I'll just forget about it. 
So is there any guidelines or anything that in the next guidelines are going to come out, how to follow up these benign nodules? Because that's about 95% of the, you know, the nodules that we see in our practice as an outpatient. Actually, I'd like to let Stephanie start to answer that one. That was not very nice. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> You're an expert in ultrasound? Come yeah. on. So, I, I mean, I have to, so, you know, the new guidelines will be coming out next year. I don't know what they're going to say in general with a benign nodule. They, we, and I don't either. I'm chairing the guidelines, and I still don't know what they're going to say. So. Okay. You know, what I, I can tell you what I generally do, and I generally do do a follow-up. If a nodule's been biopsied and it's benign, I will generally do an ultrasound again within a year to 18 months. If the nodule's stable in size, I will generally do potentially one more ultrasound in a year to 18 months. If it's stable, I don't continue to follow it. I would recommend an ultrasound again maybe in five years or so, but I don't continue. And as in cases where it's grown, if something's been benign once and then it's biopsied and it's grown, I would consider a second biopsy. If you have two biopsies of the same nodule, both of which are benign, then I do think that that is a very low risk nodule and doesn't require additional monitoring and evaluation. Yeah, and I would say I think part of what I hear is this idea of, well, can you give us better guidance on what we should do? And what we obviously are trying to do with the guidelines is, number one, evidence-based medicine as best we can. The evidence is just not there to tell us exactly what to do long-term in monitoring these, these folks. We're, these are discussions we're actually having. So then we turn to expert opinion. Um, and I think that's where you see a number of this and try to soften the stance on maybe repeat it once and then based on a number of other factors, consider either not repeating it, repeating it again a few years later. Um, it, it, uh, it, 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 the, big, the biggest reason I think it's somewhat vague is because there's no even fair evidence out there to tell us exactly what to do. And it has to be remembered that benign nodules do slowly grow. And that, you know, taking a picture two, three down, years down the road and one dimension's up by two millimeters, one's by three millimeters, it's not a drama. So at least at the Mayo Clinic, when we introduced FNA in 1979-80, by 82, we told 85% of people to go back to the farm in Iowa and forget about it. And what I'm saying is that was before ultrasound became prevalent in ACE hands. And although it's nice to keep a busy clinic and keep sonicating people, in reality, if one had to make choices at a national level, you do a negative biopsy and you believe it. Because if we took the negative biopsies from 1980 and followed them to 1995 and said, how many people are out there suing the Mayo Clinic for a false negative? 0.2% in 12 years. So it's as good a test as we've got if you've got a good cytologist. So if you believe in your cytologist, you believe that this patient doesn't need to come and see you every year unless you like them. But on the other hand, now that we have officer and it's readily available, it's nice to be objective. Because what are you missing? The cytologist is having a bad day, and a year from now it's actually any typical papillary follicular variant which nobody can agree on exists. So, can, can I, I'm, like, I'm going to say one more thing with that. Because the other thing is what the ultrasound looks like, because I think that that makes a big difference. Because if you biopsied a two centimeter spongiform nodule and it's benign, something that sonographically is clearly a benign appearing nodule is something that generally requires less follow-up. If you have a nodule that has some suspicious features, it was biopsied and it's benign, but you, you went into it thinking you were a little suspicious, those are the ones that can be false negatives and I think do require more follow-up and considering of reevaluation. So you have to pull into that, I think, the ultrasound features also in this pattern. And just to say that, you know, there's wonderful data out of the Mayo Clinic, again, on this cytologically benign, but I think now there's been some meta-reviews and meta-analyses on lar a number of large series, not just from the Mayo Clinic. And I would say that false negative rate is somewhere between 2 to 5 or 6 percent, not 0.2 percent. If you want to be, have a seat at the Mayo Clinic, maybe you can get lower like that. But it, it just in reality, what's out there at many other institutions is still very low, and it's still worth you know, monitoring, and this is why we use it as our kind of gold standard. But it's, it's, it, there is a low but a real uh, false negative rate. Now, just one little point about quality and quantity in ultrasound. As Stephanie was saying, you know, there are patterns. And old gray beards in the, out here and fellows out there are supposed to know a lot because they see a lot. And you'd think that radiologists, if they do it for 20, 30 years, would develop clinical skills and acumen. And sometimes they do, 
but it's a rare species to read a good paper from an ultrasound group that says, here are patterns that we wouldn't biopsy, and here are patterns that we would definitely biopsy. And I would ask you to seek out somewhere in the ultrasound quarterly a paper by Charbonneau, Redding and others that really, I think, influenced Susan Mandel and others like her to be ballsy enough to say, this is for the birds, you shouldn't stick needles in there. And as Martha would say, much as I respect Eric Alexander, I don't think size is key, and that not everybody with a centimetre mass in this room needs to have a biopsy, biopsy, a biopsy, if they've got six of them on the right and three on the left. What I'm saying is if you're good enough at ultrasound, as she's saying, you do it enough, you say, that looks like a bad actor, and the fact that it was benign, maybe they're wrong, maybe we'll see them six months or a year, that's common sense. But if it looks like, I wish we had stuck a needle in there, thank God it's benign. You can't wait to get that person out of your practice and be on the way to the periphery and share the guilt with the local GP. And on that happy note, it must be getting close to 11. All right, before uh, thanking our whole panel and concluding the session, I'd particularly like to thank Dr. Nabnet for mentioning on a few occasions the importance of communication with our surgeon and other colleagues and inadvertently or unknowingly putting in a plug for our third session this afternoon regarding communication with our pathology and surgical colleagues, which we hope you will all come to. So. Uh, thank you very much for submitting your cases, for being here, and to our whole expert panel for leading us through a very interesting discussion this morning.